maybe I should. Don't activate the, uh, the video, the webcam. So say you got in your car and your car only had three digits of odometer, right? Three digit odometer. Say it's a Model T and it's not expected to go more than a thousand miles. And we start cruising down the road. It was a brand new car, so it didn't have, you know, a high odometer. Each mile marker, right, our odometer increases by one. And here's the fun point. We've maxed it out. This is decimal, a decimal counting system. Decimal like our digits or something. We have 10. What are the 10 digits? It's not one through 10. That's how we count on our fingers, but it's actually zero through nine. Those are the 10 digits. What's the problem? We have maxed out. This value cannot get any higher than nine in base 10. It's called base 10 because it's based on powers of 10. So what happens? Well, this one, since it was maxed out of the high, has to go back to the low. And you know this, yeah, you've driven a car. You know. So that had to reset to the lowest and the next column had to be incremented by one. Same business, right? You, you drive further miles, you get to 019. He's maxed out again, so that bit drops back down to zero, and that one increases by one. So you keep going, right? You reach 99 miles. We've maxed out that one. That digit can't go any higher, so it resets back to the lowest value. So that one has to go up by one. Well, too bad. It's also maxed out. So it goes to the lowest value, and we add one to that one. Right? We know how to count. Eventually, we get to 999. If we only have three digits, we're kind of at a problem. What's next? Well, that one rolls over to zero. That one rolls over to zero. That one rolls over to zero. And there is no more to add one to. So, you know, back in the olden days when you reached, you know, 99,999 9 miles, it was fun to watch them all flip back to zero, right? You know, stuff like that. I'm sure people threw parties when their car got to 100,000 miles. So here we go. We've maxed it out. Our data is now corrupted. This is called overflow. We have exceeded the capacity of those three digits to hold a good value. And you'll see data flow overflow in real life. I'm sure everybody knows what Pac-Man is, video game. If you played Pac-Man and you got past level 255, there's 255 again. When it tried to draw level 256, it would draw that instead because the programmer never expected anybody to be absurd enough to play Pac-Man for the hours required to, you know, to win 255 different <laughs> levels of Pac-Man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's funny. Yeah, he's trapped. I wonder if anybody's going to join him in there or if they're just going to keep going up and down now. It looks like they're kind of stuck in a pattern, probably because he's there. Nope, he escaped. But anyways, so that was a bug because data overflow occurred. They had uh, eight bits dedicated to holding the level because surely that's enough. No idiot's ever going to play for that long. And somebody did, right? You know, and so this is a common thing that they, uh, the players who try to max out their scores, you know, in competitions go and they try to eat every ghost every single time and play all the way to this screen right so if you buy you know not buy if you download pac-man for some arcade emulator um, some people have published fixed roms with software that corrects that bug in case you just really wanted to play forever that that would be a bit much for me but all right so anyways overflow is when you've maxed it out so that's base 10 all right say we're we grew up being lobsters instead of humans, and we still only had two. So we only had four, four digits. Base four are the digits that we would do, that we would have available to us are zero, one, two, and three. And then so our lobster buys a car, but it's in base four rather than base 10. So he starts driving, he's gone another mile, he's gone another mile, We've maxed out the capacity of that place. He can't go any higher. So it resets back to the lowest value. 
and then the next one goes up by one. And the same business. He goes a little bit further, right? It's not going to go to a one four because there are no four in Lobster World. It's maxed out. It's got to increase that three back to a zero, and we increment the next one, and eventually we'll get to zero three three three. And just like nine nine rolled over to a hundred, that's going to roll over right to one hundred. And then the highest number that you could hold in those digits would be three three three. And then his lobster mobile would you know roll back over to all zeros if he drove one more mile. Nobody uses base four. That's just an example. For a while, base eight, also known as octal, right, like an octagon, was a common counting system in computer science. You keep running into eight, you know, um, when, as we talk about these things. Base two, binary. Binary is base two because it's only got two digits, zero and one. So we hop into our binary car and we drive a mile. We drive another mile. Whoops, we max that one out. We can't go to two because our counting system only has two digits. So that one resets to zero, and that one increments to one. Now we drive another mile. Well, he's maxed out, so that goes back to the minimum digit, increase that one. But that one's maxed out because zero and one, there's no two, so that goes back to that and there. So this is gonna roll over pretty quickly. We've already used up, you know, two of our three digits just in the first four. So let's keep going. Drive another mile, drive another mile, drive another mile, we've maxed it out. So the next time, you know, overflow is gonna occur at that step. Well, let's just count on our fingers, you know, the decimal equivalents of that. Well, all zeros is zero, right? And so that's a one, that's a two. I'm not explaining why, I'm just counting down, right? Just like I was counting on my fingers. Yeah. So the highest number that you could count using three bits would be seven. Just like I said, eight bits can hold a 255, three bits can hold a seven. Well, how does that add up to seven? Let's go back to base 10 for a moment. Base 10 is based on powers of 10. I'm going to use star star to represent powers of 10 because that works in Python. A lot of languages don't have an exponent symbol. This one happens to. So if you have 10 to the power of 2, 10 to the power of 1, and 10 to the power of 0. Now it's a magnet, uh, magnetic trick. It's a mathematical trick that anything to the power of 0 is 1. Doesn't matter what the number is. We just have to accept that. I'm not going to look up the mathematical proof of that. And 10 to the power of 1 just means itself. Just like 2 to the power of 1 is 2, and 3 to the power of 1 is 3. And 10 to the power of 2, that means 10 squared. Sorry for getting so mathy on this. We won't talk about math too much, but we're going to have to get through it today. And so there we go. So say we had the number 642, and we wanted to be able to figure out what that really meant. And you know already from having done, you know, 18 years of math or, you know, on up, you know, what this really means. It means 642. It means 6 times 100 plus 4 times 10 plus 2 times 1. So we have a 6 here. We have a 4 here. We have a 2 here. So 6 times 10 to the 2. Although it's kind of fun to start at this end. I'm just starting at this end because that's how we see the numbers. Plus 4 times 10 to the power of 1 plus 2 times 10 to the power of 0. If we made that easier to read and we used, you know, 110 and 1, that means 6 times 100 plus 4 times 10 plus 2 times 1. And if you added those up, right, that's 600 plus 40 plus 2 equals 642. Now. Wow, we converted from base 10 to base 10. That's like converting English to English, right? That's no big, that's no big triumph. But if we were going to do our base 4 system, it would be 4 to the power of 2, 4 to the power of 1, the 1's column, the, you know, and the 4's column, the 16's column. Why do I say that? 
because anything to the power of 0 is 1. Anything to the power of 1 is itself. Why did I put 40 there? Anything to the power of 1 is itself, and anything squared, you know, is 4 times 4 is 16. So I'm not going to write a base 4 number and show how to translate it, because nobody uses base 4. So let's skip to base 2. 1 to the power of 2. 1 to the power of 1. 1 to the power of 0. Well, what is that? Anything to the power of 0 is what? 1. Anything 1 times the power of 1 is... I'm messing up here. It's 2 to the... Wait, right, it's base 2. This was base 4. I goofed that up totally. Base 10. You can fail me today. 2 to the power of 2. 2 to the power of 1. 2 to the power of 0. All right, so anything to the power of 0 is a 1. 2 to the... Anything to the power of 1 is itself. And 2 squared is 4. So if we had a 1 there and a 1 there and a 1 there, a little line here to make it easier to read. That's 1 times 4, or 1 times 2 to the power of 2, plus 1 times 2, plus 1 times 1. And if we figure it out, what's 1 times 4? That's just 4. What's 1 times 2? That's 2. 1 times 1 is 1. 4 plus 2 plus 1 equals 7, which is back what we got up here. Three bits all turned on is seven. These eight bits that we kept running into, that add up to 255. Well, it's not just two to the power of zero, one, and two. This would take quite a while to write down. It's two to the power of seven plus two to the power of six, right? Tedious plus two to the power of five. Why don't I copy that part so I can just keep pasting it? Two to the power of four. 2 to the power of 3, 2 to the power of 2, 2 to the power of 1, 2 to the power of 0. So that's a 1. This actually is the easy part. That's a 2. Why do I say it's easy? It's just doubling each time. 8, 16, 32, 64, and 128. And just Take it on uh, faith that if you add up 128 plus 64 plus 32 and all that, if you add all those up, then that's equal to 255. So if you had eight bits in a row, right? One, two, three, right. And one times 128 plus one times 64 plus one times all these other numbers adds up to 255. An eight bit is a common computer architecture. It didn't have to be that way. Um, it's not like, you know, somebody opened a holy book and there was a commandment that said you have to have eight bits. Thou shalt have eight bits. Instead, it just became a standard. I don't know who standardized it. I can tell um, somebody did because before that, you could have different number of bits in what was known as a word, right? You'd have a 16-bit word or a 10-bit word or whatever. And it was just depending upon how, you know, the hardware was implemented, whatever chip designer, whatever hardware designer. Anyways, 8 became the standard. So since you can count from 0, 0, 0 all the way to 255, that means there's 256 different possibilities for uh, 8 bits. Just like up here, how many possibilities were there? 7 is not the right answer because we also have to count 0. So 3 bits have 8 possibilities. Right, so we could come up. If you have one bit, you have two possibilities, zero and one. If you have two bits, it's twice as many. If you have three bits, twice as many still. Four bits, I'm gonna stop doing this pretty soon. Go up to eight bits, 256 possibilities. Now there is a pattern to that. It's 2 to the power of n, like I said, we'll stop doing math pretty soon, where n is the number of bits equals the number of possible values.
So your 8-bit Nintendo could display each pixel could only be one of 256 different colors. And it's probably even more limited than that. It's probably like a 4-bit graphic system where each bit could only be one of 16 colors, but each of those 16 colors could be of a larger number, whatever. And then you bought your Genesis or your Super Nintendo. Well, that was 16 bits, bytes. We'll come back to the idea of bytes. We've heard of bytes. So two to the power of 16. I just happen to have this memorized. I'm not a genius. I've just seen this over and over. Six, five, five, three, six different possibilities. So if you had, yeah, so you had two, 65 different thousand possible values in a 16-bit computer. That number's kind of familiar. That's called 64 kilobytes. A kilobyte is a little bit more than a thousand. If you've ever taken physics or chemistry or whatever, they use the prefix kilo to mean exactly 1,000, but computer scientists use it slightly differently. So like a millimeter is, you know, one power of 10, and the kilo is another power of 10, and so on in those languages. Eight bits is a byte. So if you had 100 bytes, that's 100 times eight is 800 bits to store your memory, to store those numbers in. So that means that if you have a one megabyte machine, if we said a mega was about a million, then that's about 8 million bits. If you had a 16 megabyte machine, 16 times 8 is whatever it is. Why did they want to call them bytes? Well, because clustering the numbers together made the data easier to understand, right? If I had to look at this, you know, and I was some old and style computer programmer who, uh, you know, looked at a computer and all I saw were zeros and ones. I wouldn't want to figure out what that meant. If it was grouped together in clusters of four or eight or something like that, it'd be a lot easier to read. I'm not sure that's eight. I'm going to pretend it is. Right. That's a lot easier to read. Because then you could translate you know, those to base 10 or whatever. I'm sure I did not get eight in each one, but just pretend. Right. And so if that was a 100 and that was, you know, a, I, I, this is totally wrong. I'm making these numbers up. Right. But a string of numbers like this. is a lot easier to remember than a whole bunch of zeros and ones. So we're going to click the Wayback button and we're going to go to the mid-70s before anybody had personal computers that they could play with at home. So it used to be that you could look in the back of popular mechanics or popular science or whatever and buy a kit that would let you build a computer. And this is what the computer looked like. This is all you got. You didn't get a keyboard. You didn't get a way to hook it up to a TV. That's all you got. So if you were going to enter data into it, you would flip these eight switches. There's the eight again. And then you press another switch that was like the enter key. And so you would be typing data into it one number at a time by flipping eight switches and then hitting some kind of enter key. And then when you ran your program, after you did that, you know, enough times to write a program into it, then what would it do? It would, uh, you know, change the lights. So you weren't going to play Fortnite on that. Eventually, you know, people came up with peripheral stores so that, you know, you could you know, hook up a keyboard to it or, you know, just attach it to your TV to show letters on the TV and stuff like that. But this is really the birth of the home computer revolution. Before that, any computer that you want to install at home would probably cost in the tens of thousands of dollars because you just buy some office computer and bring it home. So zeros and ones, that's what it all boils down to, series of numbers. Are we going to go any further in that direction?
maybe a little bit further. So if we load up this site called hexed.it, we haven't talked about hexadecimal yet. Hexadecimal is a counting system that's not two bits or eight bits or ten, I mean, you know, two, two digits or eight digits or whatever. It's got 16 digits in it. Hexadecimal, decimal meaning 10, hex like a hexagon meaning six. So it's 16 different digits, zero up to nine. And then whoops, we need six more digits. We can't put 10, 11, 12 because then we're reusing our old digits. So just pick them out of nowhere. I'm gonna say that they're A, B, C, D, E, and F. And those are our digits. So if we hopped into our hexadecimal car, I'm going to skip some, right? Have we maxed out our digits, available digits yet at 0, 9? No, so it's not going to, you know, carry the 1 or anything like that, right? Because we're only here. We have more digits to go. The odometer can continue clicking. So it would count, you know, like that. Getting there, almost used them all up. Now we've used the last digit. So what happens, just like every other time, that resets back to the lowest digit and you add one to the next column. And that one stays zero. And then you could keep going, right? 011, 012, and so on. All the way down up to FFF. So it turns out that a byte is 8 bits and a byte is 2 hex digits. I'm just going to call them hex rather than hexadecimal. Digits? Digits. All right. So, hexadecimal digits, bytes, are any combination of zeros through nines and A's through F's. You could have, you know, any of these. Well, if you write any text in your computer, you're sending email, you're typing in a web address, you're writing a program, that data, when it's saved in memory, has to just be numbers. The data that you're sending over the internet has to be numbers. Anything saved to disk has to be numbers. So I'm going to save this file. I'm going to write some notes up at the top, right? This is uh, CIT1. 1113, right? And this is a Monday class, you know, and it's January 27, right? And so on. I'm going to save these notes, but then I'm going to look at them how they're saved in memory. So this is lecture B. And we may not have anything for you to upload for lecture B because I'm not expecting everybody to have typed in all these numbers. So in that case, when we create the Dropbox for it, you're just going to go and type in a note saying you were here, right? Give yourself credit for being here. All right, so I'm going to save this. I have done so. It's saved in a file called lectureb.py. I'm going to go to this hexed.it site and open that file. It's called a hex editor. People used to cheat on their Apple II and their Commodore games and stuff like that using a hex editor. And if you were, if you ever used a Game Shark, you know, or something that you plugged into your Nintendo or your Genesis or whatever to give yourself infinite lives, it did kind of the same thing. So I'm going to load up my Lecture B file. Again, I keep forgetting to enable extensions, and I think I gave you all a big lecture about that. There we go. Here it is. We see the text. Monday, class, January 27, and it's representing spaces as dots but it's also representing lots of other things as dots. We'd have to go through and figure it out. The carriage, the inner key, is also being printed as a dot here. But we can look, and every character has a number associated with it. Now, it's a hexadecimal number. Doesn't make a lot of sense to our brains. But a C happens to be a 43, and an I happens to be a 49, and a T happens to be a 54, and so on. Now, if 43 means C for some reason, then what would 44 mean? It's one past it, it's going to be a D. So type in 44 there, and that turns into a D. 
and you see this t over here? Well, what's one less than 54? If I wanted to turn it into an s, I'm going backwards, so 54 is a 53. I seem to have messed that up. I didn't get that quite right. Can I hit undo? All right, try it again. I wanted this to be a 53. All right, and that turned it into an S. D-I-S. So I'm going to save my file. Export it. Lecture B, I'm just going to call it .txt. It's not my notes file, but it's a variant of it, right? So I saved my TXT file. I'm going to go and look at it now. I'm going to double click on it and see what it looks like. And I am going to enable extensions. And I'm going to do it permanently by coming over here and changing my folder and search op options. Going to view. Do not hide my extensions, please. All right, I wanted that TXT file, which is right there. I double click on it. And instead of saying CIT, it says DIS. So how in the world did the computer decide that a C was a whatever it was, 53 or whatever, and that D was one past that? You know, what, where do those numbers come from? If I go online and I look up an ASCII table, in fact, there's one at ASCIItable.com, and how am I spelling that? ASCII is spelled A-S-C-I-I table.com. What does ASCII stand for? American Standard Code for Information Interchange or something like that. But it's not just Americans who use it. It became a worldwide standard because computers wanted to be interchangeable, right? You wanted to be able to trade data, you know, with your British friends and so on. Anyways, and so here we go. And if we go and look up what that C was, it was a hexadecimal 43. And I added one to it, I made it a 44, and I changed it to a D. Now that T was a 54, and I subtracted one from it, and it became a 53, and so it turned into an S. So when you write a program, and in memory, it's just going to be a series of numbers. That's all it's going to be, and then when you save it to disk, those numbers are going to be saved to disk. And if you hit the tab key, there's going to be a 9 written in that file or in memory. And if you hit the carriage return key, you're going to see a 15. Well, that's octal. You're going to see a D. And then it might also be followed by an A, because a D is a carriage return, and an A is a line feed. Well, what's the difference? Carriage return just sends it back to the beginning of the line. Line feed actually would roll the, the you know, the like on a typewriter, roll it up to the next line. And so some operating systems want to see a carriage return followed by a line feed. Other operating systems just want the line feeds, like Unix and Linux and Macs just want the line feeds. And DOS and early versions of Windows all want a carriage return to line feeds. And so there are some programs like Notepad where if you open a file that was created on a Mac and it's just a text file, It'll have lost all its character terms and line feeds, and it'll just be you know, one long line worth of text. So this is the ASCII chart. And if we look at it, how many different characters are saved on it? Zero all the way out to 127. Well, we kept talking about 255, and here we've only used 127. Why is that? Well, at the time it was invented, somebody was using 7-bit computers. And with 7 bits, you can hold 0 to 127, just like 8 can get you up to 255. So when 8-bit computers were invented, people came up with various extensions to ASCII. One of the extensions was one that would let you like draw boxes on the screen. And some of these you know, German characters with umlauts and stuff like that. You can kind of see a problem with this coding scheme. What if you were in Russia? They use almost a completely different alphabet. And that alphabet is not stored in these extended ASCII codes. So they didn't use ASCII. They used something else. 
what if you're using kanji or you know some uh, Asian encoding system where they have you know 400 different base letters and then you know they have you know 200,000 words that are you know either made out of those base symbols or you know different symbols for them. Yes, I thought I heard a comment. So, anyways, there's no possible way that you could store you know Chinese in an ASCII file. much less one system that can hold all these different letters. So since each one of these letters is a byte, folks who care about these things invented a multi-byte character system called Unicode. You know, one code to rule them all and in the darkness bind them if you're Lord of the Rings fan. So that way you have multiple bytes representing a single character. And so the goal is to encode every single language, every single alphabet on the planet in Unicode so that you could pull up your editor and you could read, you know, a file that was written in French and German and, and Russian, you know, and Swahili and this and that and the other. And, you know, each one of them has a letter. And nowadays, you even have emoji, which are represented by a series of bytes. So what is the hex value? of an emoji smiley. That's it. F E O F. <laughs> Whatever that is, right? So we can see since we said that two hex digits add up to a byte, four hex digits, it took two bytes to send that smiley face, you know, to myself. All right, so we have talked about hexadecimal. We have talked about binary. What I want us to do right now, we will revisit this topic. But just for now, I'm going to type in some little phrase like able. But I'm going to add spaces to it to make this easy, like two spaces between each one. And I'm going to go to ASCIItable.com and figure out the hexadecimal values. Well, an A is, you'd think I'd have this memorized by now. So using ASCII with two eyes table.com, I see that a capital A is a 41. So I'm going to write that down on my notes. That's my TXT file. I'm getting rid of that because it's confusing me. All right, so that's a 41. And a B is one more than that. I'm not going to even look it up. That's a 42. And an L, well, I have no idea until I look it up. An L in the hex column is a 4C. And lastly, an E, well, that's like 3 past a B, but I'm not going to take a guess, is a 45. So if I write the word able, it can be represented by these hexadecimal characters, but you know behind the scenes, ultimately, it's just saved as zeros and ones. Each one of these hexadecimal characters pairs being a byte. So it would take four bytes of RAM in order to save that word. Now, if it was in Unicode, it would take even more. Because it's a multi-byte character system, it would probably take eight bytes to save the word able. But Notepad and Python's editor idle are four byte. Excuse me. ASCII editors, not, uh, not Unicode editors. So if I tried to open up my German file or whatever, Notepad would do a pretty poor job of doing it. So I'm going to give you all a word. I want you to look up the word deaf. Now you don't have to, but I strongly recommend you do. You may not have this open. You could either open up idle or you could just open up Notepad. Why not open idle though? Create a new file if you haven't been taking any notes, and that's OK. And do file, new file. That's critical. Don't just do it here in the shell. File, new file. Do a save as and call it lecture B or something like that. Get it out of the Python directory and put it in, you know, whatever directory you've been saving stuff. And then def but with two spaces between each letter, give ourselves room to type. And then go to ASCIItable.com. ASCII, 
table.com and look up a D. I'll do the first letter for you. It's a 44. And look up the E and the A and the F. Shouldn't take you long. I'll give you all a minute. I'll clean up the board. So do you have to know all this math in order to be a programmer? Nah, not really. Is it a good idea to understand hexadecimal? To just know what it means, that it's numbers and letters, and that's, that's the data that gets saved to a file? Yeah, that's, that's really nice to know. If you see a number between 0 and 255, and knowing that that's a byte, that's kind of useful. Having something like this and being able to turn it into hexadecimal values, yeah, that's pretty cool. That's why we have programs to do that, that hex editor. So somebody tell me what the E is. 45. Yeah. And what's that A? 41. And that F would be one more than 45, so that's a 46. That looks like a decimal number, right? Because there's no A's and whatever. But it's not. That's in hex. I've just about run out of lecture topic. I'm going to mention one more thing. What if you had this number? And you wanted to translate that into decimal. Well, that's a 1, that's a 2, that's a 4, that's an 8, and that's a 16. So, if I was going to add that together, how many 16s are in this? In, this? in the 16s column, there's a 0. So that's 0 times 16. Plus, how many 8s are in this number? Well, what's under the 8s column? I've got to highlight it, y'all, so somebody just blurred it out. Zero. There's zero in the eights column. So that's one. No, it's still zero. Zero times eight. How many is in the fours column? Yep, there's one in the fours column. Just lining them up. And how many are in the twos column? I'll highlight it since nobody blurted it out. Zero. Yep. And how many are in the ones column? One, one. Yeah. So if I added that up, that's a four and a plus a one. And I could just eyeball that, right? There's a four and a one. So I could have taken the shortcut and said that's a four plus a one is a five. Now that 16 is making it kind of hard. I don't like to push together and I don't want to add spaces. So the next number I write down, I'm not going to put 16. I, I'm not going to add that there. But I am going to put 8421. And underneath that, I'm going to type in the number 1010. And I want you to do the same thing. Add them up. Whether you do that shortcut and go, yeah, there's an 8, you know, plus a whatever. Or whether you write it out like this. Just tell me what that adds up to. Well, are there any 8s in it? Is there one 8 in it or zero 8? Just look underneath the 8 and you can tell me. There's one 8 in it, right? So it's 8 plus something. Are there any 4s? No. No, so it's 8 plus. What's the first digit we have after that 8? That's actually a 1 in it. 2. Right. So 8 plus 2, and there's no 1s, and so that's a 10. One more for y'all to do. Type in 8421 0110 and tell me what that adds up to. Six. Yep, that adds up to a six because it doesn't have any eights, but it does have a four. And it does have a two. Doesn't have any ones. So four plus two equals six.
Yeah, let's stop here. I'm going to stop here and I'll make a Dropbox and you can either just say you are here or if you created a note file like this you can upload it. So lecture B, I'll make a Dropbox for that.